And we are welcoming you in here live to the second floor of the Multipurpose Activity Center just outside the IS Lounge as we take a break from another disastrous winter weather event here at the Jersey Shore. Matt Harmon along with Eddie Ancapinti here on GoMU Hawks and Hawk Vision. We are happy to be here for the National Signing Day for college football, what has become kind of a uh, landmark event, not just here at the Jersey Shore for Monmouth, but nationwide as well. Smack dab in the middle of uh, basketball season. Eddie, football always some way seals to, uh, seems to steal the limelight a little bit, but an exciting day for 20 student athletes that have decided that Monmouth will be their choice for the next several years. Yeah, Matt, and as you said, it's another great day, even though the weather didn't cooperate. Everything else seemed to have today. This is a tremendous setup for the uh, it seems like every year now we get to get together and talk about these new student athletes into the football program and what makes this year's class so, I think, interesting, but more than that, so much different than all the other years is that this class, for the first time this coming year, will be participating in the Big South. Obviously a big changeover. If you remember last year when we did this, it was right around that time that Monmouth was making that move from the Northeast Conference. So this year's class, obviously, day one when they step on the field, it'll be Big South football from here on out. And as you said, for 20 young men today, their lives change, as well as this football program that continues to evolve. We will have plenty of time to talk about the 20 student-athletes in greater detail. How the format will run here today is as follows. Eddie and I will lead you into Coach Callahan, who will make the official announcement of those players who have signed their national letter today to Monmouth University. We'll then be joined here back at the table by Brian Gabriel, the offensive line and recruiting coordinator for MU football. And then we'll uh, spend some time talking things over with Ross Williams, who is one of the players that is among the class here today, but is already in and enrolled at Monmouth University, part of uh, a junior college class that includes a couple of players as well. Ross playing last year at ASA uh, Community College up in New York. And then, of course, we'll uh, finish things off speaking things uh, in this class, talk about the stadium, we'll talk about the schedule, off-season stuff with the head coach of MU football. That, of course, is Kevin Callahan. Uh, Eddie, we always like to do this, as, as, as I recall, going backwards a little bit, spend a couple of minutes talking about the team from last year and it was certainly an interesting year for so many reasons playing uh, out of the Northeast Conference for the first time in so many years MU went six and six in their campaign playing as an independent uh, and all things considered you know I, I think we learned a lot about this team one of the things that I think we picked up on schedule wise was that you know the, the bump maybe and the increase in terms of student athletes that Monmouth will have to now start to recruit and uh, be able to compete against the likes of what we saw last year against the Montana State against the Liberty which will now be a conference opponent. Yeah, man, and I think that's something that since we've been uh, closely watching the program, which I know for you has been since you played on the first team in 93 up through now, uh, and me more recently, is this program continuing to evolve, and you said it, the schedule that Coach Callahan puts out every year, it, it doesn't get easy at any point, and he's only looking to schedule up and continue to do that. Well, now you take a look at some of those upscheduled teams, and they're your, they're your peers in the Big South. So what we saw, and as you said, taking a look back to the, the schedule from a year ago, a lot of playoff teams were on that schedule. The Hawks saw Liberty, one of the better teams in the Big South Conference, who could have gone to the FCS playoffs if not for the great year that Coastal Carolina had. And it was a year that we saw ups, downs, but we saw a lot of potential on this team, especially offensively from a lot of skill guys coming back, where we think this could be a pretty explosive unit with depth, which is key, moving forward into now full scholarship football. Well, I think one of the questions that was uh, a big question mark going into last season was how the schedule would kind of hold up. You know, would this team basically be able to make it through 12 games? And certainly, as you mentioned, lots of highs and lows despite starting out at 0-3. Uh, Monmouth was able to go 6-3 and in their last nine games to finish up at 6-6 six and six overall, which is you know, all things considered, I think most, most people who follow the program looked at the schedule at the beginning and said, oh boy, this is going to be uh, almost a, a nightmare type year. could be a nightmare type year for this team making that transition into the Big South. And I think in ways they maybe exceeded some expectations and in ways kind of fell short, but that's what you usually have with a 6-6 six and six team because a couple of bounces of the ball, or a few plays here and there, you could be looking at a 9-3 and three football team, not necessarily 6-6. Six and six. And how many times did we say things like that on our broadcast this year on the Shore Sports Network where we're also streaming live today that this team as you said 
put themselves in position a lot of times to be right there at the end of games. You know, the, the one that kind of pops the head uh, most quickly is the Lehigh game, a nationally ranked team, another playoff caliber team. Hawks had that game won, ended up not pulling it out. But I think the key is this team now, and you talk about these steps that programs make, and, and we've gone over it a lot with this football program, from starting, no scholarships, partial, now full. Well, then you got to take a look at the steps within full scholarship football. They've competed with some of the best in the country. Now the next step in the evolution is learning how to win those close games, and I think the reason they'll be able to do that or have a better chance this year is a lot of veteran players coming back at certain positions, but no doubt that the infusion of the talent that we'll discuss today, much needed in the program. Yeah, certainly, and, and among those as we mentioned, some of the junior college players that are already enrolled here at Monmouth. There are two from ASA, uh, that being Ross Williams, who will join us a bit later on, and Russell Mador, who is already here, along with a high school player uh, who graduated early, uh, that being Tanner Unger. He is also here already enrolled at Monmouth. So those guys get the advantage of, of partaking and participating in the spring workouts, spring practice, the winter workouts, the stuff that goes on uh, day in and day out. But for mon many of these, they are finishing out their high school year. Uh, I, do, I do know, as, as we'll send it to the podium in just a couple of minutes, uh, in speaking with Coach before we went on the air, said there were no surprises going into today. Everyone signed. Everyone faxed back in. Uh, that's usually how things go when it's nice and smooth. You don't have any last second uh, things because as, as you know and as I know, the attention that this day gets uh, from a sports media and just an overall perspective is huge. And there are those decisions that come all the way down to the wire where when you're getting ready to sign here, all of a sudden you get another piece of paper and you sign there. It becomes what has now become basically a national event. Oh, it's huge. And it really dominates the news headlines across the world of sports today, regardless of if your area is college-centric or pro-centric, everyone kind of keeps their eye on today's not only events, but also, as you said, the potential you know wrinkles that are thrown in. The other thing is, and Monmouth very fortunate to get all these players signed kind of on the books right now, but you don't have to sign today. And we've seen drama play out where some guys wait, some guys still want to weigh their options. Today is just the first day that you can sign with a college football program, and it is across all divisions, all the way from Division Three up through the highest level of football at FBS, and obviously here with full scholarship full scholarship FCS football, but you said it. It's a big day. It's a day where the eyes of the sports world kind of take a look at college football, and I know for us, we make a big deal about it, as we should here. A lot to talk about, not only with the class, with the new stadium proposal, and next year's schedule. Some more stuff I know we'll get to. Yeah, certainly, and our first guest, uh, once Coach Callahan introduces the 20-member uh, recruiting class, will be Brian Gabriel, the recruiting coordinator, who obviously, uh, his job basically never stops. And as you mentioned, I think a great point as well, this recruiting class might not necessarily be complete here today. There there may be players who uh, continue to join. You will also have walk-on players who maybe just want to come to Monmouth, whether they're going to be a scholarship player or not, who might contribute uh, during the course of their four years. You think about just things in general, the way that college football ha has basically moved on a lot of levels, and some would say to become the, the second most popular sport for so many people uh, right behind the NFL and the, in the sports world. This has really become uh, the day. In terms of the class, again, we are not going to mention the names right now. We're going to let Coach do that. But in terms of the breakdown, I think it's interesting when you think about uh, the depth that maybe we saw this team develop a little bit last year and some positions of need. One position you always need is the guys up front, the offensive line. There are four of those in this year's class, four defensive backs, which was a big question mark on the team last last year, and there will be some spots that have to be replaced uh, this season, but we did see the emergence, and a lot of players playing last year. I think what you're going to get here with four more into it is just more athletes, and that really will help things in terms of just uh, overall depth, whether it's special teams, whether it's guys who might contribute right away in that back four. And I know that's something that I'll ask Coach. I'm always curious to know how many players that he'll announce will see the field potentially next year, but as you said, regardless, there are certain positions you can never have enough of, and obviously the offensive and defensive lines are there those are kind of always high up in the breakdown of position, but uh, you mentioned defensive back, and it's huge because we have seen, obviously, with the, the last couple of years, the college football landscape change where more teams are spreading you out, more teams are throwing the ball, and not where you need potentially guys that are just going to cover receivers. You need so many athletes back there, and for no other reason, when we've seen it, guys go down. You need that next man up to be 
pretty close ability-wise to where the starter was, and I think making four defensive backs a priority here is definitely part of that. And as we saw, so many teams are going to try and stretch it and throw the football. Monmouth can never have enough guys in the back four defensively. Rest of the class breakdown by position. Three defensive linemen, two linebackers. Uh, Monmouth going a little bit deeper into the specialty units this year as well. A kicker, a punter, and a long snapper all part of this year's class. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Two wide receivers, a running back, uh, and a quarterback. That makes up the 20-person class that uh, will making, be making their announcement today, already signed their letters, signed, sealed, and delivered, as they would say. And one of the other things, Eddie, that's always been so interesting is where players come from. You know, Monmouth has always been so heavy here, not just in the Shure Conference, but in the Garden State as well. That's been the makeup of the roster for, for all these many years, all the way back to 1993. This year, no different, but a couple of interesting little additions into it. Seven from New Jersey, four Pennsylvania, two from Florida, Maryland, and Virginia, one from New York, Massachusetts, and Illinois. So what you are seeing with this movement in the Big South is that the footprint, the geographic footprint of the recruiting base starting to go up down and now over a little bit as far west as Illinois. And we'll go over it when we do the schedule, the teams that comprise the Big South for those fans not familiar that we've done so much over the course of time, but you mentioned it that those other programs in the Big South that with the addition eventually of Kennesaw State will stretch from Georgia up through Monmouth now, so you got to get everything in between, but so many of those programs go into Florida, they go into the Sunshine State, and they get some of the best talent in the country, and now we see Monmouth, which has had spot players from down there, now make that a recruiting priority as I think most college football teams do. You always have at least one guy dedicated down to Florida, and I know the Maryland-Virginia area has been very good to this Monmouth team. They're going to continue that pipeline as well as your bread and butter, which is your local recruiting base, as we see with Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then to break that down even further, still some standouts from the Shore Conference that will be coming to Monmouth next year. I think one of the interesting things, too, as we talk about this year's class, is always where last year's class stands out because there are so many guys who redshirt, who don't really see the field, who spend Spend that first year getting bigger, getting acclimated, not just to school uh, academic-wise, but also school in the in the field and being a student-athlete. So how many of those guys will now make that emergence? Of course, you'd love to see a couple of, of the 20 that we're going to talk about here today, but I always like to say, what about the 20 that were on last year, whatever the number was last year? Where are they at? How many of those guys can we see? And we did see some true freshmen uh, see time, but we also see uh, saw some true freshmen maybe never step foot on the field, but be big-time players in practice and one of the good examples I can think of is a couple of seasons ago we heard about this defensive end who was just wreaking havoc in practice in Darnell Leslie and then last year we saw him on the field and he basically proved to be what everybody thought he would be which would be a, menic, a menace in uh, opposition's backfields. You know Matt I'm not patient so for me National Signing Day is kind of a tease you know I want to see these guys on the field as quick as we can but you mentioned it Darnell on the defensive side of the ball and the one that stands out to me offensively a player that we didn't see his first year, and it really it was driving me crazy because I saw him play in high school was Neil Sterling, the standout wide receiver from Manasquan. He sat out that first year. It enables these players to get bigger and stronger, and even if they're ready that first year, you never know how the depth works out at the position that they're playing. If you've got a lot of players at that spot and you have a hard time getting them there, well, then maybe take that year. Allow yourself to get more acclimated to what's going on. We see the trend with players enrolling early continue. I know that's something that Monmouth has gotten more of every year, but I agree with you. The, the guys that sat out last season that were in the grays at home games, really, uh, that were practicing all week and then having to watch the game, they're ready to get on the field too. So while they're not while they aren't officially included in this class, they'll be part of that first wave of guys to come through, and you know they're going to be ready to get on the field. And certainly, let, let's be honest and upfront about one thing. What Monmouth needs to help ease this transition into the Big South is guys that can come in and make an immediate impact. You mentioned kind of the mid-year guys, when you can get junior college players, or as we can remember back and looking at the rosters of teams like Montana State, like Liberty, like some of the other schools that Monmouth played, what you see is you get hometown, you get in parenthesis high school, and then you get a second parenthesis schools that you played at before. Well, when you can get some of those uh, Division 1A type players, the FBS guys who decide all of a sudden they don't necessarily fit in that role anymore, maybe a coaching change, maybe they're just not getting the playing time and they want to get on the field, those are the guys that you're looking for. And now is around the time where those guys maybe start to make those decisions. Before spring ball starts, uh, all of a sudden you, you just realize that you don't want to be at a place. That's why I say this class of 20 might not necessarily be it. There could be uh, more to come, but it's those impact guys, those older guys, whether it's junior college or transfers from the SBF level, uh, the FBS level that can come in and make immediate impacts. That might be what this team needs to get themselves more competitive 
on a quicker level at the Big South. Yeah, sometimes you can't wait for a player to develop two, three years. And we saw Monmouth have success with this last season. The, the two players defensively that stand out to you are, are Tevron Brandon, Gary Onacuzzi, obviously, at corner and middle linebacker. And then offensively, KB Asante. You know, came in from West Virginia, sat out a little bit, got to learn the offense, had a standout year last year. Look for him to have a huge season coming up. So the Hawks have had success with that, and the, the trend will continue. Again, not on this list that we'll talk about and Coach will shortly mention, but as you said, that's how this depth chart, this roster will evolve from today through spring ball and then potentially even over the summer. And how can we forget the signal caller, Brandon Hill, who was also a transfer? I see Coach making his way up to the podium, so we'll throw it to him in just a minute. But, uh, you know, Eddie, if you had to think about the roster makeup from last year into this year, obviously positions of need. To me, and it's, and it's no big surprise you mentioned it, you know, the, the, the position that's always at the top in terms of breakdown is offensive line. This year, Monmouth does lose three uh, starters from last year's team. Three fifth-year guys, which are very hard to replace in Brandon Maxwell, Mike Kunchak, and Josh Patterson. So again, whether it's any of these guys, whether it's the junior college guys, whether it's guys who sat out kind of last year and made that transition into being a collegiate athlete, that's the one to me that kind of pops at you right away. Need the big guys up front to control things, to let some of those skill guys that you talked about that will come back be able to do their job. Yeah, and that's something, you know, again, as as the role that we're in, I like the flash. You know, we like receivers and running backs, as most of the fans do as well. But it only goes if the offensive line plays well. And Monmouth has had a pretty strong traditionally offensive line through the years. What makes this year so interesting is, as you mentioned, we've got the guys coming back at the skill spots. But what will need to be replaced are three of five starters as you move into a new league. So it really puts a premium on have the players that you've brought in really the last two years, are they ready? And then is anyone on this list that we'll hear shortly, are they potentially ready to go? Because the athlete you'll see in the Big South, especially in the front four defensively, is a lot better than MU has seen in the past. And certainly the other position perhaps of, of immediate need but guys that did see some time last year is in that back four, which played so much better uh, in 2013 than maybe in the last couple of seasons prior to that in 2011 and 2012. But without Tevern Brandon, without Andrew Sutton, and without Clark Coe, now all of a sudden you've got three starters that you have to fill spots, and you have pieces that maybe can slide in there a little bit, but you're still looking for those guys to kind of make that move and become starters. Now we've seen all of the players on the two deep from last year play, but the biggest thing will be is how quickly they play and play well. You know, everyone kind of got some time last year, be it in a backup role or be it in spot duty, maybe packages with nickel and dime. But you mentioned it that two, the both safeties from last year that started, they'll graduate. They're gone. And two of your three linebackers, and Dave Demergen and Gary Onacuzzi, gone as well. So a lot of spots on that defensive side that we know was heavy, em heavily emphasized here in this year's recruiting class. And I think one of the bigger things Mamet's going to miss, Matt, is how good Clark Coe was this past year. You know, he made a leap from two years ago to this year that was monumental. I know he has pro aspirations. Now, he was so good this year, and I know that'll be a hole that needs to be filled. The only guy we didn't mention in that secondary, Joe Johnson, he took huge leaps this past year. At times, he was the best player on the field for either team, so look for him to continue to develop, but you mentioned it. There will be a lot of spots on that defensive side of the ball up for grabs. Yeah, all of a sudden a guy like Joe Johnson goes from the young guy to basically the guy who's got to kind of teach. He's got to be the leader of that back four. One unit that is in pretty good shape, and I think we'll see a little bit of an infusion of some of the younger guys, whether it's this class or the class from last year, is the front seven, which at times last year just absolutely played lights out. Uh, and, and what you have with Mammoth is such a big, important part of the college football game today is you've got bona fide guys that can get to the quarterback. Darnell Leslie, we talked about on one side. Pat O'Hara had a great year on the other side. So knowing that you have those two guys back, you also get Demetrius Smith back. He sat out last year. You got really good years out of Josh Samanowitz, out of Andrew Drzinski. So that's a deep unit. That's a unit that in those four positions probably could go eight, nine, ten deep, which is exactly what you want. And we just saw a Super Bowl the other day where Seattle won without blitzing. You know, they got pressure with a front four. And the way football is played nowadays, you cannot put a premium enough at being able to drop more guys into coverage and get pressure with your front four. And you couldn't have stated it any better. The, the years that Leslie and O'Hara had were huge. At times, they were dominant. You know, you think back to some of those games, the Columbia game comes to mind quickly, where they just had the uh, opposition, no time to throw. So you can break more players into the secondary, which they'll have to do, 
and it'll be easier if the front seven takes care of business. And there's no reason to think that that group that you mentioned won't continue their solid play. I'm really excited to see what we get, especially out of Darnell and Pat this coming fall. Mammoth so far this year in terms of 2014, they have uh, begun their off-season workouts that take place here a couple of days a week uh, in the weight room, in the track facility here, obviously, as well. Uh, and then when you think ahead, uh, spring practice will start on Tuesday, March 25th. The spring game right now is set for April 26th, which is the last Saturday uh, of the month. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're kind of right there. You know, you think, well, ah, it's, it's, it's August, it's September, it's so far away. But Saturday, August 30th, will be Mama's first home game against Delaware State, a game that they'll be able to play here at home uh, in, in August, which will be the first time they've played a home date in August in the season opener in what seems like forever. In terms of the rest of the schedule right now, it's an 11-game schedule. There is an opportunity still to potentially pick up a 12th game because Monmouth does have a, a couple of buys. And for the beginning part of the year until the back end of the schedule, last week of October and then all the way through November, it's all non-league games. Six non-league games and five league games that will consist, as you said, we'll talk about the Big South makeup, Presbyterian, Charleston Southern, Liberty, Coastal Carolina, and Gardner-Webb. Monmouth will play three of those games on the road two of them at home, but MU this year, uh, at least as it sits right now, with a bye week in the middle, they will open up in weeks one and two on their schedule at home, Delaware State on October, uh, check it, August 30th, and then on September 13th, uh, it will be Wagner. So some exciting things, you know, uh, familiar names on the schedule, Duquesne, Lehigh, Robert Morris, and Columbia, new addition in Delaware State, plus the five from the Big South. I'm a little upset they're cutting into my beach time the end of the summer, but you know what? For some football, I'll gladly get off the beach down here in lovely Monmouth County. It's a great schedule, Matt. How great is it for Monmouth to be able to have two in a row at home to open up the slate? You mentioned it. One kind of before classes start here on campus and then one right after. Great way to get buzz going for this football program in the area that traditionally has a pretty good following. We saw the crowds this year be excellent at home. You have to think with some of these traditional teams that MU's playing, the fans will continue to come out, and I know they're excited to see some of these league teams come here to Kessler Field, to Monmouth Stadium, that we'll talk about a little bit as well. It's a great schedule, but it's all over the place. I hope your frequent flyer miles are ready and your, your Marriott points are all set because we're going to be on the road, and you know what? I'd have it no other way. You know, there are milestone moments that take place over the course of a program's history, and for Monmouth, you know, it's still a pretty young history. 20-plus years, uh, MU this year will make the move full-time into the Big South. And when you go all the way back to 1993 when the program started, you know, you've got 93. You've got the five championships teams uh, at, the NC, at the NEC level. You've got the year that they won the mid-major championship, finished up number one there as well. And then you've got what we'll talk about a bit later on with Coach Callahan is the final piece, it looks like, to the stadium finally getting redone, which will be such an important recruiting tool, fan experience experience thing uh, that will certainly be a, a, a just a great situation for all involved here in Monmouth. It just got released on GoMeHawks.com. We'll talk about it after we hear from Coach. We're very excited not only about this class but about that Monmouth Stadium project that was recently announced. Uh, can't wait for that to be the new home of MU football among some other sports. Crowd starting to file into uh, the IS Lounge. We're sitting just outside here. Matt Harmon along with Eddie Acapinti on the show today. We'll talk things over with Brian Gabriel with Ross Williams who is a mid-year transfer here already enrolled the class at Monmouth and of course the head coach of the Hawks Kevin Callahan he will introduce the 20 member class in just a second uh, as I said he's making his way up to the podium waiting for all to kind of filter in uh, and then we'll throw it to him we'll come back here talk to our guests and then put a wrap on this we invite you obviously after you watch it if you have any uh, comments concerns you can certainly send them to us to goamuhawks.com you can tweet them uh, as well and we'll be able to follow this team during the course of the offseason through spring practice and then take you right in to Saturday, August 30th, when Delaware State will come here to West Long Branch uh, to Mama Stadium. Looks like Coach is just about set to uh, go off. Just to recap, if you're just joining us, 20 new members of the Monmouth University football program being announced here today. Seven from New Jersey, four from Pennsylvania, two apiece from Florida, Maryland, Virginia, and then one from New York, Massachusetts, and Illinois. All positions represented uh, at the top of the breakdown by position. Four defensive backs and four in offensive linemen. Obviously keys to any particular season uh, for Monmouth to be able to continue to have success. MU coming off a 6-6 six and six year a year ago and will play for the first time this year as members of the Big South Conference. 
Yeah, I know we're just a, a few minutes away from getting the much-anticipated class announcement from Coach. People still filtering in here. We're on the second floor of the Multipurpose Activity Center, as Matt said earlier, right in the IS Lounge. It's where the Hall of Fame is housed, and I know we have a couple football players in the Hall of Fame now. And Joe Senapal, a player who was a great linebacker here, Dan Sabella. So kind of you could see both sides. We're announcing 20 new players into the program. That's the beginning. Well, if you play well enough in your time here, you could end up kind of on the wall right here to the right as we're live on Hawk Vision as well as the, on the shoresportsnetwork.com. Certainly. Maybe broadcaster section over there? Not quite yet. You know what? That's not we're not ready. One. We're not ready for that I got yet. two names for you that we have pretty much ready to go. <laughs> yeah, but we can pop them in at any point. <laughs> right. Gary, it's not you, by the nope. way. Gary all of a sudden <laughs> looked over and thought maybe it could potentially be him. He actually took the headset off. No shot. It's not. Actually, uh, there's a whole lot of people who are involved here with this uh, special broadcast that we bring you. So for all of us here at GoMuHawks.com, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Again, Mammoth, on, as part of their signing day special, the recruiting class of 2014 uh, being introduced here today. Kevin Callahan making his way up to the podium. He will be introduced, uh, and then we will kick it over there. Brian Gabriel, Ross Williams, and the head coach, Kevin Callahan, to follow here on our show. Looks like we are just about ready as we uh, peer off to our right to make sure everyone is set. I'm just trying to coordinate one thing to the next. Always fun to be doing a live broadcast. We don't want to obviously miss any of the announcement. We have been saving the 20 names for Coach to be able to do that, and as soon as he is up at the podium, uh, we are set, and we are set, so let's uh, send it over to the podium uh, right now. Just, just like to thank everybody for coming to the uh, seventh annual signing day event. Uh, in a minute, we're going to have Coach Callahan come up, and uh, he's going to run through all their, uh, the signees. Total of 18, uh, well, three mid-year guys, 15 NLIs, and then two deposited players. Uh, just want to say thank you again, and uh, without further ado, Coach Kevin Callahan. Uh, thanks, Greg, and uh, I too would like to welcome every here today, everyone here today and let you know that we certainly appreciate all of your support and all that many of you in this room have done to, to help this recruiting class come to fruition. Um, certainly Dr. McNeil and uh, all the members of the uh, campus community and many of our uh, Blue White Club members and loyal fans, uh, I just want to thank you for all of your support and in particular the, our fellow coaches here within the athletic department. Uh, thank you for turning out today, and I think this really demonstrates what a true family atmosphere we have within the Monmouth University Athletic Department. Uh, I'm here today to announce the uh, uh, Monmouth University football recruiting class of 2014. Uh, before I begin, however, I, I just want to uh, thank again everybody that had so much to do with us putting this class together. You know, I know our coaches are the guys that are on the front lines and they're out on the road nonstop. And this process began about this day last year, and they really put in a full year's work to bring this class together. Uh, but there are several members of the faculty that are here that have helped us uh, during our official visits and, and took the time to sit down with each one of these prospects and their families and talk about the different academic programs that we have to offer. Uh, certainly the offices of admissions and financial aid uh, were instrumental in this process and worked with us really on a daily basis uh, to make sure that we covered all the details uh, in each and every one of these applicants. And then the offices of student services, residential life, uh, members of the uh, sports medicine, strength and conditioning, uh, everyone who had a part um, in our recruiting official visits. Uh, the feedback that we get, that we receive from the, the parents uh, of the young men that come and visit at this campus is outstanding. And when they leave here, they really feel that it, it's truly a very personable place where everyone cares about them, uh, as not only as a football player, but as a young man and as a student. And we can only send that message if everyone works cooperatively here to, br to bring that together. Uh, in each and every weekend on an official visit, in this room where we are right now, we have several members of the campus community that help us, uh, that visit with the young men and their families and, and, and help them feel very welcome here at Mama. Um, and certainly uh, the Office of Student-Athlete Development, 
uh, Rochelle Paul, Ruth Jamnick, Tom Beaver, Claude Taylor. Uh, we're working with them in everything from compliance, initial eligibility, uh, you, and to up, up to the, uh, the national letters of intent that uh, were finally all came in this morning. Um, you know, they provide this assistance and guidance to us uh, throughout the entire process, and it's certainly very valuable. And, and finally, I, I would like to recognize uh, Greg Viscomi and the Office of Athletic Communications for all that he does, all of the, uh, the graphics that you see, the Twitter, the Facebook, all of the ways that we get our message out is, is uh, extremely valuable uh, in putting together a, a fine recruiting class. Um, this class of 2014 represents our first recruiting class as a member of the Big South Conference. You know, we're, and we're extremely excited about this group of young men that we have successfully put together to attend Monmouth University. Uh, we were able to satisfy many of our positional needs, if not all of our positional needs, in addition to adding some desired depth in many positions. Uh, this class has good balance, as you'll see. There's nine players on the defensive side, eight on the offensive side, and there's two specialists. And, and the class ranges in, in its footprint, the geographic footprint, from the state of Massachusetts to Miami, Florida, from the Atlantic Ocean here on the New Jersey coast out to Chicago, Illinois. So we've greatly expanded the areas that we're recruiting. We've been able to do that because as a member of the Big South, we are now playing in a different, uh, many different locations. So we're bringing a, a very diverse class geographically to the university as well. And, and finally, I, I, I need to applaud the work of our coaches, the assistant coaching staffs, or most of them are seated, uh, right, seated right up here in the front, uh, who work very dil diligently year round, as I was saying, uh, going back to, to last winter, all the way through this morning to put this class together. And that's all headed up by Brian Gabriel, who's our recruiting coordina coordinator, and all these guys do an excellent job in bringing not just good football players, but great young men and great people uh, to this campus. And uh, my final comment is I'd like to add that this class that we've been able to put together uh, is as talented and as able academically as it is athletically. So in addition to bringing in what I feel are terrific football players to the university, we're bringing in terrific students as well. Uh, what I'd like to do now is announce the, the members of the class of 2014, make some comments about each of the players, and then when I'm finished, I'll entertain any questions that anybody may have. Uh, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Uh, and the first uh, prospect is um, uh, Mike Basile. Mike's a defensive back from uh, Brick, New Jersey, played at Brick Memorial High School. He's one of the local uh, products in this class, a, a very talented player, was named to All Shore Conference as a senior, very explosive, physical, defensive back, a terrific hitter, uh, and he's going to be a great asset for us in the secondary. Uh, Russell Clayton is an offensive lineman uh, from Monroe Township High School, not too far from here. Uh, he's 6'4", 275 pounds. He was an all-Middlesex County player. Uh, he attended one of our, our, our one-day summer camps, and we were very impressed by his athleticism for a big guy. He's got a long frame. We project him to play as an offensive tackle, uh, and he's just got excellent feet. Uh, John Coleman is one of the two kicking specialists that we brought in and included in this class. John is from Sparta, New Jersey. He's got an extremely strong leg. He had 40 touchbacks as a senior on kickoffs. Uh, he kicked 10 field goals, 59 extra points in the 2013 season alone. He's got excellent height on his place kicks, and his speed to the ball is very good. It's going to be a great asset to our kicking game. Kyle Gregory is another defensive back from Germantown, Maryland. At 5'10", 175 pounds. Uh, he's got quick feet, good, very good hips. He's an excellent tackler and got very good ball skills. He was a true playmaker. Uh, for his Quince Orchard High School team uh, down in Maryland. Uh, it's a third year in a row that we've been able to uh, attract a player from Quince Orchard High School. Uh, he was another guy that attended our summer camp and performed very well. Agbai Aroha, another defensive back from Union High School in Union, New Jersey. Uh, he's 5'9", 190 pounds. He's just a very explosive player, an excellent tackler. Uh, plays with a, a very high motor and a great deal of intensity. Uh, he's also able to, to demonstrate uh, very good vision when he's on the field. Uh, Michael Jolly is a running back from Springfield, Virginia. Uh, he's a, not the tallest guy in the class at 5'6", 170 uh, pounds, but he's extremely, extremely explosive. He's electric when he has the ball in his hands. 
had a terrific senior season. He's got great feet, outstanding acceleration. And what he doesn't have in size, he certainly makes up for in his ability to, to, to go the distance and, and, and take the ball to the end zone. He's a very difficult to get off his feet. He's got excellent balance. Shaquille Joyner is a linebacker that joins us from uh, ASA Junior College in Brooklyn. Originally, he's from Chicago, Illinois. He was a, two, a teammate of the two young men sitting up here that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, he, he came to us from ASA Junior College, as I said. Uh, he's a very physical, athletic linebacker, uh, and we project him to play in the middle linebacker position. Marcus Leslie is a defensive back from Miami, Florida, played at Coral Reef High School. Uh, he's got excellent speed and quickness. Um, just a, a very, very productive player on his high school team. Extremely, uh, very highly recruited by a number of colleges on all levels. Uh, was able to play offense, defense. Uh, he was a, very impressive in the, on special teams for his high school as well. Uh, was a great addition to our secondary. Uh, Rochelle Meter, offensive lineman, 6'5", 330 pounds. Rochelle, why don't you stand up? We have Rochelle right here, right now with us right here. Rochelle and Ross are able to be here because they're already enrolled in school. Uh, they graduated from ASA in early January and were able to enroll here at Monmouth uh, for the start of the spring semester. Rochelle played his high school football at Abraham Lincoln High School, Lincoln high school in Brooklyn, uh, and then went on to ASA. He plays with a lot of power. He's a dominant offensive lineman, and uh, he's working very hard right now in, in our winter weight training and conditioning program. Uh, Peter Riggy is another offensive lineman from uh, Rumson Fairhaven High School and lives in Fairhaven, New Jersey. 6'3", 285 pounds. Uh, another local product, uh, was an all-short all conference player. Uh, what impressed us about Peter was his, his intensity, his toughness, almost the nastiness the way he plays the game. Nastiness in a nice way. Uh, the, the way that football coaches like nastiness. Um, he's a very tough physical player. We project him to play one of our interior offensive line positions, either the guard or center spots. Uh, Zach Talley is a linebacker from uh, Quakertown, Pennsylvania. He played at Lansdale Catholic High School. It's 6'3", 225 pounds. He has excellent size, very good movement and range, and, and an excellent tackler. He's somebody that will project as one of the outside linebacker positions. Davon Thomas is another uh, uh, Monmouth County uh, 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 prospect. He's uh, from the Shore area, played at Allentown High School, lives in Mil Millstone, New Jersey, uh, played both defensive tackle and tailback for his high school team. And that gives you an idea of uh, the, his, his quickness, his foot speed, and how athletic he is. He's six feet, 260 pounds, uh, excellent athlete, very good with his uh, hands. He's very quick with his hands and has great feet. He projects as an interior defensive lineman. Uh, Tanner Unger is another defensive lineman from uh, Mount Joy, Pennsylvania. I uh, played at Hempfield High School at 6'4", 285 pounds. Tanner is enrolled in Monmouth as well. He graduated from uh, high school early. He's in class right now, and that's why he's not with us. Uh, he's got very good feet. He's a very strong, explosive player. Another guy that projects on the interior of the defensive line. Uh, Ryan Wetzel, another short conference product from Colts Neck High School. He lives in Freehold, New Jersey at 6'4", 285 pounds. Uh, another all short conference offensive lineman. Another guy that performed extremely well at our summer camp. Uh, we, we took a liking to him once we had an opportunity to work with him. He's got a great frame. He's got a very long reach and arm span. Another guy that projects as an offensive tackle. Reggie White uh, is a receiver from Randallstown, Maryland, played at uh, Milford Mill High School. He's a son of a former NFL player, Reggie White Sr. He's a big, athletic, outside receiver. He runs great routes. He's a long strider and covers a lot of ground. Um, and, and he was selected to play in the Big 33 game against the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Matt White is our second specialist in this class. Matt White is a punter kicker from Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. That's out in the western Pennsylvania area near Pittsburgh. Played at Mars Area High School. Uh, very, very talented punter who also kicks. Um, I like the way that he gets the ball off quickly on his punts. He's a true uh, two-step punter. He's got excellent leg extension and, uh, and form. I um, mean, he had excellent times. He really gets the ball off very quickly. 
Uh, Cody Williams is the quarterback of the 2014 class. Uh, Cody Williams played at Central High School in, the st in, in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, he's 6'4", 180 pounds. Um, he's a, an athletic quarterback with an excellent arm. Extremely productive as a, as a high school quarterback. Uh, uh, won 30 games in the last three seasons uh, starting for the uh, Central High School team. Uh, was a Western Massachusetts Player of the Year in, Mass in the state of Massachusetts. He was also the ESPN Gatorade Player of the Year for the state of Massachusetts. He has the ability to, to uh, make plays with his legs and with his arms. Um, and, and what we uh, learned about Cody when he was at our camp last summer is he's a fierce competitor. Uh, and and he's, a, he's a great addition to our team. Uh, and the final member that, that uh, is with us here today is Ross Williams. Ross is a defensive end from Jacksonville, Florida. Ross, stand up here. Ross is 6'5", 250 pounds. Uh, Ross enrolled here at Monmouth in, in January. He's another product of uh, ASA. Um, he went to ASA um, from Jacksonville, Florida. He's a very tall, athletic defensive lineman who runs very well for his size. Um, I'm sorry, there's Ross's picture right there. Uh, two additional uh, players that have made commitments to attend uh, Monmouth University have been accepted to, to the university and uh, um, uh, paid their enrollment deposit. Uh, Mike Christ is a long snapper from Dominion High School in Sterling, Virginia. Also plays in the defensive line. Another guy who attended our summer camp. And Matt DeMarco is a receiver uh, from Wilkes-Barre, uh, Pennsylvania, where he played at uh, Myers High School. He's an re outside receiver with very good speed, uh, runs good routes, and, and, and really has the ability to make plays after the catch. So with, there are a few additions that will be coming up here uh, to this class in the next couple of days. Uh, we're just waiting for some paperwork to be finalized on a few of them. But this is the class of 2014. Thank you. Uh, I'll entertain any questions that anyone may have at this time. Jeremy. Yeah, hi, Coach. Uh, hi, Jeremy. First of all, uh, one quick clarification. Why are those two players separated from everybody else? Uh, are those final two players in the same? In order, to, in order for us, by, according to the NCAA rule, in order for us to announce somebody on signing day, they have to sign a national letter of intent or an institutional grant and aid agreement, or they have to have been admitted and deposited and enrolled uh, through the university's normal admission process. Oh, okay. Second question. Um, for the Big South and making this transition, was there a different kind of player that you looked for? Because one thing that I kept hearing over and over again was speed. Was that something that you were specifically looking for in regards to I think the best way that, that, that I could answer that is when we went down and played at Liberty in the second game of the season and we stood on our sideline and we looked at their sideline and we said, we need some of those guys. <laughs> so I, I guess the answer is yes to that. Um, there, there's definitely a, a, a step up that we felt we needed to take. Nothing against the players in our program, but as we move forward and enter a, a, a new league and a new level of competition, and have the ability to play an FBS opponent within the next two years. Um, we knew we needed to upgrade um, the, the players in our program, and that started with this class. But I'll also add that by being a member of the Big South, uh, that opened up uh, a lot of doors that maybe would not have opened up to us when we were in the Northeast Conference. Kevin. I would certainly hope so. Um, I, I think if we've identified and evaluated properly, then there will be a number of players in this class who have the ability to make an immediate impact. I think each and every year, as you pointed out, Kevin, going maybe over the last five or six years, each year there seems to be more freshmen who are either starting or in the mix and, and seeing significant playing time. This last season, 2013, was really no different. I think there were probably six or seven of the freshmen that, that really saw some significant action there, and I think that trend will continue. 
Jeremy. Well, I mean, I can say this. It wasn't that we were unhappy with what we have. Uh, we graduated one of the most productive kickers in Monmouth University history in Eric Spillane. He holds six of the seven major kicking records. He's graduated. He's moved on. Uh, the punter, our punter who's returning, Ryan Moore, is going to be a senior this fall. Lucas Santangelo, who handled our kickoffs uh, last fall, is going to be a junior. We don't have anybody that backs up either of them. So if something were to happen to Lucas Santangelo, we wouldn't be able to kick the ball for an entire season. Or if something happened to Ryan Moore, we wouldn't be able to punt the ball for the entire season. You know, those were two options that I wasn't really thrilled with. So I felt that we had to go out and, and get quality backups in each of those spots. Uh, uh, and, and in each case, they're do, they both, Matt White is more of a, uh, a punter kicker and John Coleman is more of a kicker punter. So I think we've got adequate backups and, and we've got the required depth in both those positions now and in doing so we were able to bring in two very talented young men. No, it's, 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 it's certainly not coincidental. I mean, we use every member of our, our, our program, every member of our team to help us in the recruitment process, whether it's getting information about a prospect who maybe attends their school that they have, they, they have a relationship with, or, or, and they certainly help us on the visit when the prospect vi comes, comes to Monmouth. But I, I think there's no greater salesman for your program than the people in your program. And if they can talk to the people that they know back at their high school or their junior college or whatever it may be and tell them of their experience here and, and give them details on the, how the program is run uh, and what the, the team chemistry and the relationship with coaches, all of those things are important, how they deal with, that, with the, the professors. You utilize all of those things in recruitment. I think we, we, we make a point of using the guys within our, within our program. Kevin. It will certainly make an impact, and, and we will use it in every way that we possibly can. Um, it, it, once everything else is even, once a player is offered a scholarship, and they can go to school A and school B, and both of them are offering them scholarships, and they feel that there's balance between the academic programs at school A and school B, the number one thing that high school prospects look at is facilities. Sir, they're, they're, they're looking at the players on the team in a relationship with coaches, but they're looking at facilities. Where are they going to play? And, you know, in college athletics now, facilities is the big arm race. And, and, and people are escalating that and doing things bigger and faster just because their, their rival school is doing things bigger and faster. So that's certainly a, a very, very important part of it. And as we move forward into the Big South, it'll be something that, that we use every single day. Question back here. Yes. Well, Jen, first, I want to thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. That's two of us that have been here for 22 years. Uh, um, 
and, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I think as we move forward, um, you know, our goal is to win the Big South Conference and represent Monmouth University in the FCS playoffs. We saw firsthand when we played Liberty and teams or opponents like Montana State this year that to go from where we were with the, the limitations and scholarships in the Northeast Conference to the Big South Conference that there's a significant step we have to take. This year is step one, but we're not looking at this as a, a four-year process. We're looking at this as a right-now process. And if you talk to the members of our team, and you can ask these guys right here, guys that are going through our, our, our winter conditioning and weight training program with Tim Ream, our strength coach, uh, we're preparing to win right now. And, and we're going to do everything in our power to do that. Other questions? Well, that, that's a great point, Marilyn, and that kind of ties into uh, Jeremy's question, I believe it was here, of using our players. And we have a number of former players now who are either high school coaches or, or working with high school teams, and, and they've been a, a tremendous asset uh, to the coach, to all of our coaches in this whole recruitment process. Uh, there's a number of them that are right here in the local area and the shore, but there's also many spread throughout the state who who really um, give us some inside information and, 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 and help us in this process. Now, they have to be a little careful in doing that. They've got to be careful how hard they push and how hard they direct a young man our way. But the information and insight that we get from them is, is extremely valuable, and it's, it's just another resource that, as a coaching staff, we utilize. Well, I think that, you know, first and foremost, you know, they, we have to make sure that, from our standpoint, that they are the right type of young man that we want to come into, bring into our program. And there's, there's three defining characteristics that every one of the young men in this class and every one of the young men that we recruit on a yearly basis has. And, and first and foremost, they've got to have a good character. They've got to be somebody who makes good decisions and does the right thing no matter where they are, whether it's in the, the resident hall, whether it's in the dining hall, whether it's on the field, wherever it is. Secondly, they've got to be academically motivated. They've got to care about getting an education. And they've got to have a destination for themselves in mind four or five years down the road, even if they don't know exactly what shape it's going to take. But they have to be motivated to earn a college degree. And the third thing is good football players, guys who have the athletic talent and the football skills to help move us yet another step higher in terms of our competitiveness. Once we find the young men that have that, we do everything we can to try to get them here for our summer camp so that we have a first-hand opportunity to work with them individually, find out who they are, find out more about their personalities, how you can coach them, what, how you can motivate them. Once they pass that test of the summer camp, and that's why you'll see of the 15 guys that signed NLIs here, um, actually uh, 10 of them were at our summer camps. Um, so that's an important step in the process. Then we'll try to get them here for a game, if, if they can make it in with their schedule. But while this is going on, we're going out to see them as well. We, spend time, we go into their homes. We get to meet their parents. They get to know us, even though they maybe haven't been on campus. And then when we bring them to campus, I think it's very important for us to put them in front of as many people from the different facets of the campus life that we can. We want them to sit with professors. We want them to meet people uh, that staff from residential life. We want them to meet our training staff, our strength coach. We want them to meet Dr. McNeil and our athletic administration. And we invite as many of those people to kind of a sort of a meet and greet uh, that's one of the first things on the visit so that they do get a good feeling for the place. Once we've accomplished that, the university quite honestly sells itself. And all we have to do is go through the day and a half or two days that were with us, and we do very well in terms of our yield. This year we visited 23 prospects on official visits, and 18 of them are coming to Monmouth University. So we feel very good about what we're doing and how we do it, and it's a process that 
quite honestly, we try to refine and, and, and make better each and every year. Kevin? I think there's something to be said for that, Kevin, and I also think part of it is that New Jersey is just saturated in the recruitment process uh, because it's, it's, it's such a densely populated state, and you can fly into the state of New Jersey, you can fly into Newark, or you can fly into Philadelphia, and you can get to every corner of the state within two hours. So it's a very, retract a very attractive recruiting ground for people from outside the state. Um, you go to see a young man in the high school, and on the way in, you'll pass four guys going out, and then when you're coming out, you'll pass four guys going in. That's just the way it is. Um, when you go outside the state of New Jersey, areas that aren't quite as densely populated, it, they're not as heavily recruited. And, and I think sometimes you can, you can create a better impression. I think the other thing that, that, that as a coaching staff, we try to educate people on all the time is that it's, it's not 1993 anymore. And when we started football in 1993, it was non-scholarship. But, you know, we were playing at an entirely different level than we are in 2014. So we've got to make sure that the message is getting out there that we are truly a different program than we were back then, and we need to go after a different athlete. Jeremy. Okay, the, um, well, the first part of that is it certainly will expand our recruiting areas, and it already has. We've seen evidence of that in this class. I mean, Ross, for instance. Ross is from Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, he may have come to Monmouth anyways, but the fact that we'll be playing games in North Carolina, South Carolina, that are much closer to his family's homes, and his family goes to every one of his games, makes it a little bit easier for them to get to half the games anyway. So th I think that's a natural. We've also seen, already seen a, an increase in the interest in the state of Virginia as, as we move further south and play in our games. Um, but on a side note to that, while we'll be playing in the southeast, I, I really am excited about playing late November games against teams from South Carolina right out here. You know, that, that, that's, that I'm looking at it the other way around, too. We'll, we'll get an advantage that way. And as far as when do the players... Uh, first come on our radar from a recruiting standpoint, it, it's, it's ongoing. We already have a significant list and significant information on guys who are high school juniors and sophomores. And as early as, I hate to say tomorrow for these guys, but they've already begun working on next year's class and evaluating video and, and finding out what the next step is going to be. So it, it's usually right after one class ends, the next one begins. So many of them come on the radar very, very quickly. But, that does, but that's ongoing. There may be guys that we first become involved with in November, and they may end up being some of our other players. So we're always looking to uncover the best possible candidates to put in our class. Any other questions? Well, I, again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. We're very excited about this class uh, in, in terms of the, the number of players that are, are, are included in it, but also the talent level of these players. And we're, we're, we're extremely excited and look forward very much to the contributions that they're going to make here at Monmouth University as we move forward. Thank you all for coming.
Caius Lounge, the Hall of Fame area here in the Multipurpose Activity Center. Matt Harmon, Eddie Acapinti, and now joined by offensive line and recruiting coordinator Brian Gabriel, who spent uh, s how many hours, Coach? Uh, Countless? Do you even count, keep track? Yeah. I mean, was there one year that maybe you just started writing numbers down saying five hours here, 15 minutes here, five minutes here, email this way? I tell you what, it'd be scary if you put all those hours you know, on the road and, you know, calling kids and, and being here till nine last night, you know, from six in the morning till nine at night. So I couldn't even begin to, to figure out that. That'd be crazy. When you think about uh, the immediate reaction, you hear a coach kind of run through the 20 names that are part of this recruiting class. Your immediate thoughts, just the, the future of what these guys and, and, and the key to the Mammoth program. Yeah, sure. This was uh, just a phenomenal recruiting class. And, you know, why we're so excited about it is, um, you know, moving to the Big South in our first class and, and recruiting in the Big South, we knew we, we had to recruit um, even a higher caliber player. Um, and that was our target this year. We started from this day last year to try to compile a list and start looking at guys. And, you know, the, the players we've been able to recruit this year um, is, is a higher caliber high school player. We've beat better programs uh, for these players and um, you know this class moving to the Big South is going to give us that that uh, foot in the door that we need to compete quickly at that level. And coach when you put this great 20-man class together what were some of the things you and the other assistant coaches obviously head coach Kevin Callahan looked upon we can tell the numbers by breakdown where the emphasis was but what were some of the things you guys were talking about that you needed for this class well one of the things I can speak specifically to offensive line is we needed uh, guys who were talented athletically uh, to play at that level but also um, physical nasty players and to kind of uh, get in and, and we want to be the bully as we got to go to the big south we want to be physical we want to be tough um, and that's the biggest thing from an offensive line standpoint and bringing the four young men that we brought in uh, that were very important to us um, you can see we concentrated uh, in the defensive backfields um, we felt like uh, some of the uh, speed we're going to see down there and you know in addition to playing in the big south uh, our competitive uh, out of conference schedule um, and joining you know in, in a 1a game here in, in a couple of years a bcs game um, we need guys that that can cover um, and you see um, you know, we spent a lot of time recruiting defensive backs this year, and what we think is uh, some phenomenal football players who should come in here and, and be athletically uh, on par with anyone we have um, right now in the program. The process, Coach, I mean, never, never really stops when you think about it. You know, 20 guys on this list, if you had to just estimate a little bit how many how many guys at one point is Monmouth into you know that that's the term that you're kind of sure. into a guy and then obviously it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to this point yeah it's funny yes because we have you know a, a recruiting program and all that stuff and we still have you know a magnetic warboard um, and on that warboard it's probably about 120 guys um, so you look at uh, kind of the way we rank guys and then you know by position um, and then guys we were very serious about to got to the point where we you know we're watching them comparing them I'd say you know 120 125 guys um, in total and then obviously it, it subtracts as guys you lose them or you know you gain as you find more guys but you know probably 120 125 guys on our recruiting board right now yeah coach one of the things that I'm always curious and we're speaking to offensive line coach Brian Gabriel you know Matt and I are both grads of Monmouth University I'm always curious how our coaches sell Monmouth University to these recruits especially recruits that you're kind of getting more to a wide base now of student athletes that you can go after and get we know the Monmouth Stadium project was just announced but as coach said during his remarks he didn't have that during this recruiting cycle so so what do you and the other coaches out on the road what are you selling to these recruits about Monmouth University and the football program that's a great question and you know one of the things about Monmouth is I, I've always felt like once we get guys on campus we're in a great position once they see what we're about um, we're in a great spot you know the, the trick is to get them on campus um, you know in terms of uh, you know what we're selling uh, you know I would say that coach Callahan uh, being here 21 now 22 years um, the consistency in our program me going on my 11th season a number of our coaches a lot of our guys uh, coaches that had played here um, the consistency and, and truly caring about the players that we have um, that they're going to be taken care of here um, the second thing, you know, academics and the location um, are both phenomenal, um, and I, I think that's great. The one area we have to been deficient in is, is in our, our facilities, and now with building the MAC that we've done a couple of years ago, we put ourselves in a first-class venue with a first-class locker room, and now with the addition of, uh, of the stadium we'll be building, um, you know, we feel like we'll have as good of, good of facilities as anyone in the Northeast in FCS football, um, which to me puts us in the living room of any prospect we want, um, whereas that, that has been an area we've struggled. 
Coach, the geographic footprint, as Coach kind of spoke about a little bit at the podium a couple of minutes ago, uh, has now obviously increased. You know, it's, it's down as far south to Florida. You know, Monmouth has always had that little strong foothold in the Virginia, Maryland area, and now as far west as Illinois. Do you see that uh, as something that is not only crucial but also increasing as the program kind of continues to develop a little bit? Yeah, that's an interesting question because the one thing you have to be very careful is you develop relationships in areas and you develop, uh, develop uh, relationships both ways. So when you go just kind of cherry pick certain areas, the, the thing that you can get in trouble with is a coach can vouch for a guy, but he really, you know, you don't know him all that well. You know, he, do, he knows that maybe you'll never come back there so he can sell a guy and, and the relationship you don't necessarily have with that coach. Um, what you do, you have to, when you choose the areas you're going to recruit, you have to have relationships in those areas. Um, we've obviously always taken a four or five hour radius from campus and made made that our own. That was that was the area we recruited. That's the, where we we're going to get the majority of our guys. Um, adding Coach Dorsett, you know, a South Florida native to going down there with relationships uh, that he already has and recruiting there consistently in the last five years of his career, um, he has those relationships. Uh, the one thing I would not want to do is just go into, just pick a random area and say, okay, let's go recruit there one year and just say, let's pick up a few guys. Um, I think you need to have relationships I, I think that Mama's footprint will always be within five hours of our campus because there's phenomenal football playing here and we have great relationships with coaches in this area. But I do think that we, as we continue to expand, we can look for other areas that we, ha we can develop relationships in to make sure we're bringing in the people in our program that we want to have in our program. And Coach, we take a look at the list, which will be available on GoMeHawks.com, re really as soon as the press conference started today. Uh, when you take a look at these student athletes coming into Monmouth, a lot of true freshmen, but we see the trend of players enrolling early continue, either coming in mid-year or going for those older players that have some experience already. As a coach, when you're recruiting them and then when you bring them in, what do you look for maybe from a true freshman as compared to a guy who's been around a couple years has already played football out of high school? Uh, well, I'd say this. Uh, uh one of the reasons we've never been a huge junior college, uh, you know, uh, university, one of the things we felt like there were a couple positions we had to address mid-year with guys who have already played at a high level of college football and bringing in both an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman in those positions. Um, you know, when you bring in junior college guys, you have to make sure that you have a relationship with their coach, that you've done your homework on those guys, um, that they're guys that are truly committed to being great football players and great in the classroom. And both the young men we brought in from ASA as mid-year guys have shown that as well as uh, Shaq who's coming in this spring as a linebacker from ASA as well. Uh, I've had relationship with the, the coaches up there for a while. I've known their off the line coach for 12 years. Um, so I had that relationship. I knew the background on that. Uh, in terms of a high school guy, you know, like uh, bringing in, we, we were very lucky to bring in Tanner uh, this year as a mid-year guy. I, I don't know um, if that will continue more than one a year because graduating in high school mid-year is, is difficult. Uh, some places a little easier. We've had to, some guys in the past have done as well. Um, but I don't know if we'll ever get to the point like you know you see like the Ohio State of Florida is where they have six seven mid-year guys um, high school guys as well because the guys are recruiting don't necessarily on that path as early as some of those those players are so um, I don't know if that'll continue but it's always nice to have two to three guys in the mid-year to join you right away and they're with you all winter and and spring and, and you're developing them. Brian one more for me uh, the biggest difference between this year as opposed to years past maybe not necessarily level of athlete but now with the ability for the football program in in kind of its second year i guess but i i almost consider it its, its first full year to be able to do this and offer full scholarships as opposed to maybe take a scholarship and and slice it in half so you can get two kids for the price of one uh, a lot of these players and players moving forward will be full ride scholarship type players yeah, I mean, like you said, the first thing is the athleticism. But the other thing you get is in recruiting, um, it's much more uh, um, narrowed down. You know, when, when you're recruiting with breaking up scholarships and things like that, it's kind of a numbers game. You're kind of trying to figure it all out. When you're recruiting these kids, these are guys that we have legitimately recruited for a year. We've been talking to them as, as many times as NCAA rules will allow. Uh, we've had them on campus as many times as we could. Um, these are guys that we've worked with all year, we've developed great relationships with, um, whereas, you know, in the past you kind of had to split some scholarships up, you, you, you know, you kind of had a numbers game, some guys could afford it, you had to figure out the financial stuff. Now you're talking about a guy who's getting a full scholarship to play football at Monmouth, and we're going to be able to uh, ask a lot of that player even more than, than we have in the past, and, and I think that's only going to lead to better things. Brian, I always appreciate you uh, coming by on our signing day special, always uh, full of information. 
Now get back to work. <laughs> well, I appreciate <laughs> you probably that have a couple of phone calls you still got to make, right? Well, here's the deal. As we said, you know, this this is it right now, but the but the recruiting trail never really stops, does it? Today we're going to take the rest of the day off mm. and celebrate uh, celebrate this class and all the hard work our coaches have done. Tomorrow we begin scheduling camps. We begin uh, junior recruiting, uh, really getting the names, starting to put together our board, start evaluating juniors. So uh, we're going to give the, take the rest of the day off. Brian, uh, thanks. Thank you. Congratulations. Appreciate Good job. Guys. Thank you. Thanks, you guys Coach. Are great Appreciate job. it. Hard, Thank you. hard work certainly shows up here uh, on paper. Brian Gabriel, the offensive line and recruiting coordinator here for Monmouth, longtime member of the staff. What we'll do now is bring in one of those mid-year guys. It is uh, Ross Williams, who will sit down at the table and join us uh, a little bit. Ross, 6'5", 250 pound, his uh, hometown Jacksonville, Florida, spent the last couple years at ASA. Ross, want to welcome you in here to our Sandy Day special. How's things going here in West Long Branch? For you. Everything's good, yes, sir. Glad to be here. When you think about uh, the the process, maybe for you, you know, a, a couple years older than a lot of the guys who made this announcement here mm -hmm. today, but you part of this recruiting class. Yes, sir. Um, how how different is it for you to be a couple years older, a couple years wiser, a couple mm -hmm. years more mature? I feel like it's coming in now. You have a better from a junior college. You have a more chance to play right away. You know, coming from high school, you might have to get developed a little more, or you have to, you know, what I'm saying just get in the weight room a little more, anything like that. But uh, junior college, they're recruiting you to play right away. So that's the big, biggest difference, really. And, Ross, something that, that I'm always curious about, I asked Coach how, how the coaches sell Monmouth to student-athletes. Now we mm -hmm. get it from your point of view. Yes, sir. Y you've seen a lot of other schools. What mm -hmm. about Monmouth University was your ultimately deciding factors in you joining us? <coughs> I, felt like, I felt like it was home to me. I felt the, coach, the coaching staff was very honest. You know what I'm saying? And um, they, they just welcomed me and they act like they really wanted me, you know. So that was probably my biggest biggest uh, reason for choosing Monmouth. You're one of the two guys who uh, originally have a hometown in Florida, yes, in sir. Jacksonville, yeah. um, but you've kind of made your home here in the Northeast. Yes, you did a, a prep year uh, in Virginia and then the last couple of years at, at ASA. Mm -hmm. when, when you look out the window in what we've had here and what's <laughs> been kind of a tough winter, uh, maybe maybe makes you long for Florida a little bit. When you think about it, though, you've almost become accustomed to the Northeast a little bit, which probably makes that transition from uh, ASA to Monmouth even a little bit easier. Yes, sir, it does, definitely, but I do miss, miss the Florida weather though but gotta get yeah I mean I'm pretty much used to the snow and things now so yes make sir. you a deal next next training session you guys <laughs> have in the weight room we'll turn the heat up really hot <laughs> and we'll see if we can make it a little bit better like that right um, Ross when, when you think about moving forward now what are, what are your expectations uh, not necessarily from an individual standpoint but how 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 quick do you feel like Monmouth can make this now full move and transition into the Big <coughs> South and be competitive in the league right away most definitely. I, I came here to win championships, multiple. I'm here for two years. I'm trying to win two championships, conference championships, national championships. That's my goal, and that should be the team's goal. I love that answer. You know, I don't think you get any better right than that. Right up your alley right oh, there. Oh, man. I, I, Ross, we're going to be friends, and it's going to happen pretty early. <laughs> yes, Talking sir. to Ross Williams, your defensive line recruit for Monmouth University. And, and, Ross, my final question for you, you, you talk about those goals, mm -hmm. and you mentioned yours in addition to the teams. Yes, what are some of the things that you'll bring to the table for your teammates, for the fans that are going to come see you play mm -hmm. here at Monmouth Stadium, that they can look for where they'll know that you're going to meet those goals? Intensity. I feel like I play with intensity, and the, the fans will see that, my teammates will see that, and everybody will see that. that I'm just out there. I'm gonna. I won't. I can't be stopped, and I will do my part in helping the team get championships. Yes, sir. Ross, one more uh, for me before we let you go. Do you feel like your role as a guy, as I mentioned, an older guy, you've got a couple years playing at ASA uh, mm -hmm. under your belt a little bit. Can you come in here and, and not necessarily make that impact on the field like you just talked about, which I, I don't think will be in question. Mm -hmm. What about from the leadership standpoint? How's the adjustment going for you? You know, all of a sudden, mid-year, we get this new guy in the program. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you, you can come in and, and, and really be who you want to be with, yes, with, with the guys on the team? Yes, sir. I, I feel that way. But right now, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm the new guy. I'm still the new guy, so I'm just working hard. And when they see me working hard, hopefully they be like, okay, he's working hard, so he could be a leader. You know what I'm saying? He could be a leader like us because he, he has on the same mission we are. So 
Yes, sir. All right. When it's hot and sunny in August, make sure you remember what it looked like here in February. <laughs> All right. All right. Appreciate. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes, Welcome yes, aboard. Thank you. That is uh, Ross Williams, who is good enough to give us a couple of minutes here. Defensive lineman, 6'5", 250 pounds, uh, part of a 20-member class that's being announced here at Monmouth University. Just waiting for the uh, head coach, Kevin Callahan, to swing over and give us a couple minutes, our final interview. Um, I, I know you like what he just said, right? I tell you what, th there's championships and in intensity. It doesn't get much better than that in a word. Those are the two things that you want, and, and you like what you hear, not only from the individual perspective out of Ross, and we know that sentiment is going to be echoed through the program, but but just mentioning that, you know, he knows he's kind of the new guy, even though he's been around a, a little more, but going to come in, going to work hard. You know, the coaches like to hear that, and, and we do as well. You know, obviously being so closely tied to the program, but, but Matt, that it's it's great to hear. We, you kind of led the broadcast off saying it's great that football's back, and I like to hear football players talk like that young man just did. Final segment here for us on our signing day special at the uh, in the IS Lounge, just outside the IS Lounge, second floor of the Multipurpose Activity Center, and good enough to give us a couple minutes here on another big day, historic day. Coach Boy, there's been a lot of changes the last couple of years. You think uh, two years ago, you're still in the NEC. Last year as an independent, now this year going in to the Big South. Just talk about the, the direction of this football program before we even get into the recruiting class. I mean, it, it has been significant changes over the last couple of years. It has, Matt, and, and change is good. And, and, it's, and this has all been positive change. And we're on an upward trend right now, moving from the NEC. Even though that we spent one year as an independent, it allowed us the opportunities to go play and play is like Bozeman, Montana against the second ranked team in the nation and we went to Lynchburg, Virginia to play what will be a future Big South opponent in, in Liberty and, and it's allowed us to schedule teams, even the non-conference games that are all of high caliber and, 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 and I think what that has done is allowed us to attract a different athlete, to attract a, a higher level player who wants to play that competitive schedule week in and week out and, and you know, with this move going into the Big South I think we're going to see firsthand, you know that the program is, is, is you know, uh, perched to take yet another step forward. And in 2015, we'll have an FBS game on the schedule. So there's nothing but positive steps that are out in front of us. A varied class for sure when you think about the, the area and the states that uh, some of the players are coming from. But as you as always have recognized, New Jersey is the base. It has to be the base. And Coach Gabriel kind of echoed that as well. Uh, and even a little bit closer to home, you and I have spoke to, uh, numerous times during the course of, of this past football season how good the level of play here was this past season at the Shore Conference, and I know you're happy to have the three guys that are coming here that were all Shore Conference guys last year. Very happy about them, and, and we've always had a philosophy of, of working inside out in our recruitment, that we're going to take care of our own backyard first, and that starts with the Shore Conference, the high schools that play in Monmouth and Ocean Counties. Uh, it's, a, it's a level of football that's extremely well coached. Uh, the players are motivated. The level and the, the, the talent level of the players coming out of the Shore Conference each and every year is just outstanding. I think if you look at the guys who signed national letters of intent today from the Shore Conference, you're going to have well over 20 players that did that, and that includes several on the FBS level. So it's, it's a great place to start, and we work outside from the Shore, get into the state of New Jersey, and then go into our other secondary areas. And when you say those three guys, Mike Basile being one, Ryan Wetzel, uh, and Pete Riggy from Brick Memorial, Colts Neck, and Rumson for Haven High School. And Coach, something that I want to ask you on, to echo your first sentiment, talked about and Matt and I as well, the, the kind of upward trend that Mama football's in. It seems like every year when we sit down here, we're talking about those next steps that the program can take. We'll talk stadium in a second, but first, this 20-man recruiting class that we just spoke to one, Ross Williams, how do you see these young men fitting in to that upward trajectory of Mama football? Well, I think they all represent the, the type of player, the type of young man that we need in our program to take this next step. I think, you know, if you look at the 22-year the history of our program, it's been a series of steps. Every four or five years, we would take a significant step forward. And, 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 and we're right here at the beginning of another significant step. And in order to do that and be successful as we do that, we need to elevate the, the level of player uh, that we are bringing into the program. And I think what you see with this, 20-person class as you see um, another level of player coming into the program. When you think about uh, certainly, you know, 
kind of poking around and seeing where some of these guys, uh, other schools that were in on him. It, it is hard to ignore uh, the fact that a guy like Marcus Leslie, who's a defensive back uh, player from, from down in South Florida, was a guy that was fairly heavily recruited. You know, had a lot of the, not just the, the big FBS schools, but some of the FCS schools looking at him as well. And I think that kind of echoes the point, Coach, what you were talking about. You're, you're making that move into getting into that higher level play, player, which you almost have to. We, we, we definitely have to, and, and I think that, you know, the, co the assistant coaches did a terrific job of identifying that level of player and then going out and successfully bringing them to Mammoth so that they, they would sign with us here today. Um, is, and where you mentioned a Marcus Leslie, you mentioned a Cody Williams, guys who were, were highly sought after and had a number of opportunities for us to be able to get them to Mama to bring them into our program. I think it, 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 it says a lot about where the program is heading, the level that we're going to be playing at, the facilities that we're going to be playing in. And Coach, we know that you, you are a very big player on the FCS football level. You served on all the committees. You know a lot of these coaches. Where do you think Mammoth now fits into things, moving into the Big South, as Matt and I have mentioned, full-time, full scholarship football? We know that league put a team in the final eight in the FCS playoffs this past year in Coastal Carolina. Where do you see now MU fitting in, specifically with this recruiting class, among your peer institutions? Well, I think when it comes to um, talking about how Mammoth fits into the Big South, I think we're still going to be the new kids on the block. You know, we're still the little brother that's got to go out and play with the older brothers out on the playground and, and see how we stack up. I think this class has allowed us to grow up a little bit faster to take a significant step. As you, you notice, there are some guys that have some college playing experience that are represented in this class, and, and I think that's going to help us with the transition. But we still have to go out and, and earn it on the field, and we still have to prove ourselves on the fields, and, and that's what we're going to be out to do this year. Coach, is this a different class, and obviously it's different names, but is a different class in that you may be expecting a bit more of these potential player student athletes to come in and play right away because you know in years past there were players who were recruited to play in the NEC and 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 you've had some high level players that have done uh, amazing things and certainly they are uh, athletic ability wise they can they can stack up with the teams that even you played against last year with Liberty with Montana State but this really counts as the first class in which you knew you were going into a new league. It, it does, and, and that was one of the questions that I was asked in the open forum over there, you know, where I saw this class in, in terms of getting playing time uh, early on in their careers. And I think that if we have done a, a, a good job in our evaluation and our recruitment process, and I believe that we have, I think that you'll see a number of these players contribute very early on. And that in no way is, is, is meant to you know, discount any of the players in our program right now. But as you said, Matt, as we have taken a step forward as a football program in terms of the conference uh, affiliation, it's allowed us to take a step forward in the recruitment of athletes who understand the difference in that conference affiliation and where it can lead to. Uh, right down to the point where the, we will now be able to play an FBS opponent. And I think as you recruit a young man and you have – uh, the ability to play a game like that, that's going to put you into another group, a different group of players than maybe not having that ability. And Coach, I think another thing we would all agree that puts you into that category is right here for our fans watching on Hawk Vision is the new announcement of Mammoth Stadium, that project being announced to go where the existing structure is. Now, you didn't have the, the benefit of knowing that when you were recruiting this class and still able to sign a very good 20-man class. How does that now change things, especially knowing what you're going to see in the Big South. Well, I'm not going to say we didn't mention it before, but uh, <laughs> even though it wasn't official, but uh, um, I, I think it, it, it legitimizes everything else about the program. We now have or are moving towards getting the same number of scholarships that everybody else will have. We've got the beautiful, uh, beautiful facility in the MAC, um, and we have a football facility that needs a, an upgrade. And as we make this upgrade, as we provide a beautiful facility to play football in, just as we have here to play basketball in, I think it's going to continue to attract the higher level player to Monmouth University. Coach, you know, uh, Eddie and I spent some time at the beginning part of the show always saying, well, these are the 20 guys signed today, but there was a, a big class that was signed last year that we didn't really see a whole lot of. You know, I know there were some freshmen that did play, but, uh, mo you know, as is very typical, freshmen 
will often redshirt and acclimate themselves into college both academically and athletically. Uh, what about the, the strides and gains maybe from what will be the sophomore class between last year and now this year with a full year plus of being involved with the Monmouth program? Well, you know, you're right, Matt. The class that we brought in a year ago had 20-some guys in it, and, you know, I felt very, very good and still feel very good about the guys in that class. Uh, I think there were six or seven of them who actually saw playing time uh, in 2013 as freshmen. But, the, you know, one of the keys to having a successful program is, is not only to be successful in recruitment, but it's also to be successful in development. You have to recruit and develop. And this freshman class that, that are currently freshmen here at the university, um, we're, in, we're working in that developmental phase right now, and I like the progress that many of them are, are making, and I fully expect to see many, many of them on the field for us this fall. Coach, final question for me in regards to the recruiting class that you just announced and as, as we roll along here on Hawk Vision. We see, and as Matt mentioned, some of the players that are already in the program. Now you get the injection of some new talent. We asked Coach Gabriel. We actually got to ask Ross, who's one of the guys I want to ask you about. Some of these players that you guys ha have gone out and gotten older players who maybe can contribute right away. They've already been out of high school for a couple of years. You have guys enrolling early. Have you noticed that being a bigger trend in college football, specifically with what you want to address in some of the needs of your program? Well, I think you know each and every year there's a, a, a number of guys that you're recruiting that would like to enroll early if they can. Um, this year there was one young man in, in, in Tanner Unger who was able to enroll early out of high school. And then we were able to bring in two guys from, from the junior college level. And I, I think when you look at the junior college level, that, and I, I, we're never going to go out and recruit solely on the junior college level. But I think as you look at your depth charts and where you have positions of need or may need some immediate help, there's an advantage to going out and bringing in a player who's already played on the college level, against college level competition. And that's what we attempted to do this year, to identify some of the positions where we, we were young, where we needed that older player where we maybe had some gaps in those older classes and fill those in with some of the guys for, that had already had some college experience. Something that we saw last year uh, in playing other teams that had that litany of players from the uh, uh, FBS level kind of drop down, you and, and the Monmouth program saw that last year as well. Gary Anacuzzi coming in, right. filling a spot that you needed for a year. Uh, Tevin Brandon finally getting himself back right. onto the football field and being part of that. So, um, you know, as, as we said with to Coach Gabriel, you know, this is 20 guys that are on the piece of paper now, but there always are those options of players who might be looking for a home after spring ball or maybe prior to spring ball who things just might not be working out, but they want to make sure that whether it's a year or two years, they get themselves on the field as quick as they can. Without a doubt, and that's something that, you know, we're always open to and keep our ears and eyes open for somebody that may happen with. And, you know, we especially know of guys from the state of New Jersey or from the shore who've maybe gone on and, and are playing at an FBS program and for whatever reason may not be happy and want to come back home. And, and now Mammoth is a... Is a uh, a fully funded FCS program is a viable option for them. Coach, final uh, question. It's how you and I wrapped up uh, the past season talking about the schedule coming up this year. Uh, and obviously spring ball will start in late March, the spring game in late April, and then quickly thereafter it will be preseason and uh, Saturday, August 30th will come here in West Long Branch when Delaware State comes in. It is a year that you could play 12 games. Right now there's 11 on the schedule uh, with two buys. I know there's, there has been some talk of still looking for that 12th game or being happy to have that extra buy making the transition into the Big South. Well, it, it, the 12th game is certainly an option that we're keeping open at this point. Matter of fact, I, I probably on a, a daily basis of I'm fielding or exchanging emails with somebody who may have an interest in playing. Obviously, it would have to be a date that fits with our, our open dates. Uh, I'm, I prefer to keep our second open date, that October 18th date, uh, free right now because it kind of creates a separation between the conference and non-conference schedules. Uh, but there's an early date in September that we've had some conversations with. And I guess what I can say right now is it would have to be the right fit. Uh, I would prefer it to be a home game so that we'd be balanced home and away. If we were to go to a 12th game, I would like it to be a quality opponent uh, that, would, that would add something to our schedule. Coach, we appreciate you coming by and giving us uh, a few minutes. I know certainly an exciting day. It, it kind of highlights, you know, the, the midpoint of the of the off season, the winter, a whole new class coming in. Uh, kind of get yourself um, uh, reinvigorated in a way. So thanks for coming by, giving us uh, giving us some knowledge on what's coming in. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for your efforts and thanks for supporting us on this day. All right, that is the head coach uh, Kevin Callahan. We'll let him. Uh,
we'll let you go, Coach. We'll, we'll wrap <laughs> it up here for a couple minutes. I know you probably got a couple of babies to kiss and hands to shake before you uh, do get out of here. But Thank it, you, Coach. As, as, as we say uh, goodbye here, Eddie, you know, it, it has been, as we've said a couple of times here today, it's been a significant event in college football, signing day. Um, and and, it, and I think it comes at a great time. You know, right after the Super Bowl on that first Wednesday, football are still kind of on the minds of a lot of people from all of the NFL stuff just wrapping up. And now you go back to college football. And then you, you can, you can realistically say spring practice is about, you know, six, seven, eight weeks away, and then the spring game, and then you get a little bit of a break, and then it's preseason, and then, you know, it's like almost in a blink of an eye, it, it will be the end of August. Yeah, that 12-month clock that, you know, the NFL has perfected. Now college football has kind of done the same thing where, you know, they don't have a draft, but what they have is signing day, and this is what these programs get to do to replenish their talent, but also keep people energized. You saw the really good turnout we had up here in the IS Lounge. A lot of people that support the program, season ticket holders, they want to come and see the future of this program, especially one that is taking such new steps every year. And as I said to Coach, you know, and I'll say it again to you, it seems as though every year we do this, uh, Mammoth doing something different, you know, e whether switching leagues, adding scholarships, improving facilities. So these athletes that we mentioned, these student athletes that will be joining us, uh, Mammoth is better next year than it was now, and we know that's just going to continue to be the trend. But it, it is an exciting day. It's good for you and I always to hop on talk some football. It's been potentially baby steps over the course of, of the first 20 years, and now I feel like big leaps and bounds over the course of the last two as Mammoth will enter year number 22 of its football history uh, coming up this uh, fall which will be starting in August, the 30th, uh, which will be the first uh, game. Uh, partner, this was a lot of fun. It's always great to talk college football, always great to invigorate not just us here, but the uh, the fans and the supporters here, the blue-white supporters, those who watch on Hawk Vision, and hopefully a lot of our new student-athletes. is They're not able to be here today, but they and their and their parents and family can watch us. And, um, you know, from all of us here at Monmouth, we are certainly exciting, uh, excited about this 20-person class. Absolutely, and, and I think what... Ross Williams said, I know the other student athletes, if they're watching and listening to us, they probably felt the exact same way. They're ready to get in, get to work, work towards championships, work towards improving this program. I loved his energy, and as always, partner, you're the best in the game for, for no, for obviously, for this reason that, uh, you, you know, we love doing this, and, and I know I speak for you when I say we, we can't get to August 30th soon enough. Great job as always. Yep, appreciate it. Eddie Acapinti here joining us uh, at the IS Lounge for our guest today, head coach Kevin Callahan, recruiting coordinator, offensive line coach Brian Gabriel, and new student athlete Ross Williams, part of a 20-person class. Matt Horman saying uh, thanks so much for watching here on Hawk Vision. For more on this and the recruiting class in general, click on the link at GoMUHawks.com under the football news button, and you'll be able to get up-to-date information on all 20 guys part of this class. For Eddie Acapinti, Matt Harmon, for all of us here at GoMUHawks.com and all involved with the broadcast today, thanks so much for watching, and as always, Go Hawks!